Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Gilbert Eichleboom. I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to be the host of this dedicated takeover. So today we're going to discuss various topics and I'm excited. I'm excited to meet you here in the chat. Again, my name is Gilbert Eichleboom. I'm the founder of Mind Speaking, the human side of data, the side that we not often discuss, but often is really important in uh, in data. I'm curious, of course, where you're all joining from today. So let me know in the chat where you live, where you are right now. What is your country, your city? Let's uh, let's see what type of people we have in the chat today. And uh, I'm looking forward to make it an interactive session. So please, if you have any questions when you join, please do join in the chat and. Let me know and let's have a conversation around people skills for analytical thinkers. Also, what I'm curious about, not just where you're from, but also what is the last thing you bought at IKEA? And of course, not everyone has purchased ever anything at IKEA, but most of you have, I'm pretty sure. So what's the last thing you bought at IKEA? Later, we're gonna come back to this in my presentation. Also, I have exciting news because I'll be giving away two books, two pieces of people skills for analytical thinkers. My book that I published exactly one year ago. If you want to be part of the raffle, if you want to make a chance to win this book, then put hashtag mind speaking in the chat. So looking forward to seeing all the hashtag mind speakings. I'm going to give away this book halfway the session and at the very end of the session. So make sure you participate in the raffle if you're interested in this orange book. So we have some people. Hi, George. Nice to see you. Hi, Lisa. And Kate bought some closets from Ikea. Hello, Najim, Dallas. Greg is also participating in the raffle. Welcome. Great to see everyone here. Good. I have one more, uh, one more question because today I'm going to structure my presentation not with a lot of slides, but instead we're going to do it slightly differently. Instead of bringing a lot of slides, I brought four objects that will represent some solutions and some problems to challenges that we encounter as a data professional. So let's see what we have here. We have a piece of tape, a roll of tape. We have a hammer. What else do we have? A towel. Any idea what the towel is for? If you have an idea what these objects stands for or what they bring to mind for you, let me know in the chat. I'm curious to see. So again, what we have seen is a, a roll of tape, a hammer, and a towel. And the last objects is this illustration. Wonderful illustration. So of course, that already triggers some parts of your Primal brain, uh, we're going to talk about that later as well. As you can see here, the primal brain and the rational brain. And this picture probably triggered a lot of your primal brain. But we go, we'll get back to that later. So we see some uh, some ideas. Uh, tape holding things together. Hi, Natasha. Uh, hi, Scott. Um, holding things together, certainly, uh, certainly true. I see my... Um, my camera is unfocused. It's gonna go uh, come back later, I'm sure. Let me uh, fix it right away. Here we go. All right, so um, to do a quick introduction, my name is Gilbert Eichelboom. I'm the founder of Mind Speaking. Uh, in my career in data analytics, I spent uh, my time working for Capgemini and uh, Cognizant. And working in data, I really loved working with data, like all of you. 
But I also noticed that I loved psychology. I loved helping other people grow, giving training and helping other people develop their communication skills. Also, my background is in behavioral science, and that's why I uh, founded Mind Speaking to bring those two worlds together. First of all, psychology, and second, data. And that's also what we're going to talk about today, because today we're going to talk about people skills for analytical thinkers. So let's start here. We have shown a few of the objects and let's, uh, let's dive into the presentation because I want to take you back to the year 2014. Because in that year, I remember very vividly, I was doing a presentation for the management team. And before that session, they asked me to present insights. So what I did as a data analyst is dive into the data, doing all the technical work, all the analytical, uh, analytical work, so that in that presentation, I was pretty sure they would adopt my recommendations. But despite my optimism, it failed. Because in that meeting, they bounced off all the ideas. And especially, there was one man who was not in favor of my recommendations. Because there was one thing I forgot about. There was one obstacle I overlooked. And there was one person I neglected. And that person was Giovanni. And Giovanni was a part of the management team. He was an Italian man, small, bold, and a big, big pasta belly. And he was friendly. We had a good connection, even though we didn't speak often. But in that meeting, Giovanni bounced off all my ideas. He just was just sitting there like a, like a wall. And in that meeting, it didn't work. So after the meeting, nothing got implemented. And I was pretty frustrated. I was a bit sad because I worked so hard on doing the ana analysis, working on the data, but eventually nothing got implemented. So maybe you have an idea what went wrong. What mistakes did I make in that session? Let me know in the chat. What do you think went wrong in that presentation and before that presentation as well? I'm curious to hear. What I found out when talking to my mentor, it was clear. It was clear that I was too focused on the analytical side and not enough on the communication side, on the people side, understanding what matters to my audience. And actually there was another time where I was very, very focused on the analytical side. And that was when I was playing poker on a professional level. And I love poker. I played online and I loved it because every time I played six to eight tables at the same time, and every time I need to make a decision, I could click on one of the player icons and then 100 data points appeared that told me what to do. So I could basically base all my decisions based on data. And isn't that wonderful? In the, on the poker table, it was brilliant because by analyzing the data, I could optimize my decisions. I could improve and improve. Um, and at some point, because I was doing that next to my studies uh, when I was 20 years old. But at some point, I need to have a conversation with my parents about that, about, about saying I want to go full time and pause my studies for a bit. And of course, that was not a conversation I was looking forward to. It was not a conversation I was looking forward to, but I'm happy I had the conversation because it allowed me to focus more on poker. But so on poker, at some point, it went very well. I could analyze my data and make my decisions accordingly. But of course, outside of the poker table, it didn't work that way. I could not analyze my decisions. I could not 
see what's the next best action in the social interaction. So also talking with other people, I was analyzing what I was about to say. Is this smart enough? Is this good enough? Is this funny enough? And because I was thinking so much, it didn't really help. So in fact, you can also see it this way, that I was very focused on the analytical side, on the spades and clubs, and not enough on the hearts and diamonds, the emotion, the storytelling. And as a result, I own only half of the cards, half of the information. So I had one pair instead of four of a kind. So what this shows is that we need both sides and that's why we're here today. So after playing poker, I decided to learn everything about psychology, reading a lot of books, studying behavioral science, and I, and I loved it, but I still wanted to work with data. That's why I had a career in data analytics. So in this presentation, in the session today, this takeover, we're gonna talk about all these mistakes I made in the presentation with Giovanni. Actually four mistakes, four major mistakes, and every object represents a mistake. And for every mistake, I will give several practical tips that you can put in practice right away. Because that's my goal for you to walk away from this session, having clear takeaways, what you can do in your job. I see a lot of comments coming in. Thank you. Keep them coming. I see, um, I did not acknowledge him exactly, Carrie. So many things can go wrong in the presentation, definitely. I did not speak to my audience. Absolutely. Yeah, so there, those are some examples. In person versus online dynamics is a big one, especially now we're working in an online environment like most of us. It's uh, something we need to be mindful of. Back to the story and we'll come to the four objects. So fast forward from the poker story, fast forward 10 years and I'm writing this book. So it's basically a book about human behavior, but then written in a data language. And I'm curious because of course the title says analytical thinkers, but what does, what does it even mean? So to, to understand how many analytical thinkers we have in the digital room today, let's have a look. So here are 20 words, and I'm curious to hear from you how many you recognize in yourself. So how many of these 20 words do you recognize in yourself? Please put the number in the, in the chat on LinkedIn, YouTube, wherever you're dialing in from. All right, great. I'll get back to it in a minute. And good, good to see the interactivity indeed. So, but the question of course is why, uh, why do, does this even matter? You know, the soft skills, the communication skills. And I'm also, I'm also wondering how many of you actually find this important? I put this, um, I put this image last time. Let me show you. So here we go. And now you must be able to see my screen. There are some So here we go. So what do you think about this picture? Do you agree? <laughs> yes or no? You can put it in the chat. In the meantime, I see the, <laughs> the, the comments coming in, how many words you recognize as an analytical thinker. Uh, I see most of the people above 10 and 42 even. Uh, well, wow, that's, a, that's a lot, David. Maybe uh, you're counting words twice or three times. Uh, you're probably an analytical thinker then. Um, Alejandra, 
with almost my uh, first name as last name, 14, I see 15, this is great. Okay, so we have a lot of different uh, different type of people. In the meantime, I put this image on. So communication skills are supported as technical skills. And I'm curious if you're, uh, if you agree. Um, okay, Lisa, Lisa disagrees, I see, because she thinks communication skills are more important. That's interesting. Great. Absolutely. Communication skills matter. This is, uh, this is good to see guys. I'm, uh, I'm happy to see this because this is something I'm advocating and I see more and more in the market that people, uh, find it important and a real shift. And it's not, uh, out of the blue because we've seen research from McKinsey that demand for soft skills will increase by 24%, um, until 2030. And also research by Deloitte saying that hybrid jobs, so hybrid jobs are jobs that combine technical skills and communication skills are in highest demand today and also the highest acceleration in salaries. So this is the, this is really good to see. Where I want to move now is to decision making because I talk a lot about decision making. In data, we contribute to, let me hide the comment. In, 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 in data, we dis, we contribute to making better decisions. And that's what our job is about as a data professional, contributing to better decision, because you can have the best model, the greatest insights, or the fanciest algorithm, but, it, but in the end, it's about business outcomes. It's about helping the business make better decisions. That's why these communication skills are so important. Now let's take a step back and talk about these decisions because right now imagine you're driving you're driving a car and you're driving a car towards a red traffic light and the question is when do you brake when do you press the brake pedal what do you think so maybe you take into account the speed the distance, the other cars, and those variables are more rational, but maybe you also take into account other type of variables, more emotional variables. If you have your car sick child next to you, maybe you brake a bit softer, or if you're on the way to an appointment with your manager, then maybe uh, if you're in a rush, maybe you jump the red traffic light. I don't know what's your driving behavior. Let me let me know in the comments. So why I say all this is because based on all the variables, we make a decision. And in fact, as data professionals, we like we usually overestimate how rational we are, how important those rational variables are, because in the example with the car, of course, the rational variables like speed, distance, the objective ones, the factual ones are important. But in communication and collaboration, there and at work, there are a lot of emotional variables at play. And my point is that we need to understand those emotional variables because they matter. They, in the end, they make up, they determine whether people will use their data, yes or no. In fact, research by Gerald Zaltman from Harvard University, he found that 95% of decision-making happens in the unconscious brain and is mostly driven by emotions. And this is yeah, supported by many other neuroscientists like Antonio Damasio. If you're interested in this stuff, read his books because his, his books are, are very good. So let me, um, let me show you what I, uh, how I call this in my book, because let me sh share my screen again. All right. So some example algorithms. Because based on all the variables that we have, the rational variables and the emotional variables, 
we make a decision and we process them with our algorithms, our brain. So to make this more concrete, let's give a few examples. So imagine the situation is as follows. If I'm in the kitchen, the stove is turned on and then your algorithm processes that into, I do not touch the stove. It's very simple, right? You probably touch the stove once and never do it again. You save an algorithm in your brain saying, okay, this is something you don't wanna do. Next example, if a new colleague joins the team, then you make her, him or her feel welcome. It's easy, right? It's something we learn. It's, you don't really need to think about it. Another example, if my girlfriend, personal example from mine, if my girlfriend talks about her problems, then I give her solutions. <laughs> And I can tell you this is not a very good strategy, but it's something I'm working on, all right? It's something I'm working on, but it's my engineer mindset, my analytical mindset that wants to solve all the problems in front of me. So for people who recognize this in themselves or in other people, let me know in the chat. Thank you very much, uh, Rohit, for uh, sharing that the examples are good. So, these are some example algorithms, but I want to go uh, go back to Giovanni and the mistakes that I made. Do you remember? So quick recap for people that just joined. I did a presentation for the management team. It failed. And there were several mistakes that I made, four mistakes, in fact, that I made that I want to talk about. And for each of those mistakes, I have an object, like a towel. And for each of those mistakes, I also give practical tips that you can implement right away in your data job. But before we go ahead, I would like to do the raffle because we have the, because we have the, the raffle of course for my book. So let's see how many entries we have. We have 34 entries. So now let's have a look who is going to be the winner. So today, the first winner of today is Birapa. Congratulations. Let me, uh, please send me a message on LinkedIn and I'll make sure a book comes your way. So again, this was the first raffle of today. Um, please enter the enter hashtag mind speaking in the chat if you want to participate in the second raffle to win the book uh, for the second time all right so as mentioned we have the story of giovanni and the four mistakes and right now we're going to zoom in off on each of those four mistakes you're excited i am very excited to move it on so Let's have a look at the mistake. The first mistake that, mistake that I made because I made a few, I told you. Let's have a look. Okay, my, um, my PowerPoint is not always working well, but um, it's, it's all good. I see a lot of people already participating in the second one, great. And uh, Mirapa, read and report back. I, uh, I love it. <laughs> okay, so we go back to Giovanni, mistake number one, to put it in uh, algorithms terms. So if a colleague asks a question or shows a business problem, then I go into problem solving mode. This is what I often do, you know, and it's not, it's not always the best idea but it's a mistake I, uh, I certainly made. So let's have a look. It relates to this, this object, the towel, because how it relates to the object, I will tell you, because I remember vividly when I was a child, I was nine, year old, nine years old, and I went with my parents on holidays. And when we arrived, when we arrived at the holiday destination, the first thing I did is 
take my towel and jump into the swimming pool. And I was so excited, so passionate. The vacation started. And my parents were unpacking and were settling down in the holiday destination. And I didn't really help them. I was just so excited to jump in, to, to go for it. And I think this is what, and this is what many data professionals do. When they see a business problem, they jump in. They don't have the full perspective. They don't ask enough questions to understand the business problem and to understand what are the, the needs and the goals of the stakeholder in front of them. So this is something data professionals need to do. So how do you do it? A few suggestions. You can, you really need to peel the onion and understand the core of the, of the problem by, for example, by asking five times why and really get to the core of the problem. Or think about this way, who has seen Memento, the movie? Have you seen it? If you have, then you know that Memento is a very special movie. Why? For the people that have not seen the movie. The movie is special because the movie Memento is not chronological. In fact, it's totally the opposite. So it means that the first frame that you see, the first scene, is actually the last one. And I think this is a great metaphor for us to working in data. Because when we first start with the end, with the very last scene, what success looks like to that person in front of you, what are his or her goals and how can you contribute to that? That's what it all starts with. So think about Memento. <laughs> I will share a link where you can purchase the, the towel. The color is very exciting, I, uh, I agree. So another, another tip to work with the business to understand their problems is by using the three C's. First of all, connection. First, make the connection with your stakeholder. Don't jump into problem solving, but make the connection by saying, hey, I see this is important for you and let's work together on getting these data insights. The second C is curiosity. Ask a lot of questions and understand the business need. The third one is clarity. You summarize what you're gonna do and you will say, okay, this is what we agreed. I, I understand this is important for you. So here are these insights I will, I will get or this dashboard I will make for you. And what I want to point out is that there's a, a difference between wants and needs. So again, let me go back to the presentation. and show it on the screen. So wants and needs. So of course, people often describe what they want. You know, they want AI or they want, they want this dashboard. But for you as a data professional, data scientist, data engineer, data analyst, you need to uncover what's below it. What's the why, what's the problem and what are the personal goals? And that's how you can create long-term value. This is very important. So again, first object and first mistake was to dive into the data too soon because what otherwise happens as mentioned the three C's, what otherwise happens is this. Imagine you go to a hairdresser and then you, as the hairdresser, shows this. So you need to explain, pe people in the business need to explain well what they want, but you also need to ask questions and understand what they need. Because many data professionals, what I have seen is they design a solution, a dashboard, or they get insights and they get very enthusiastic. They say, I love it, you know, look at this picture. But in fact, you need to think from the user end perspective, you know, the end user perspective. How do they see it? What, what is their perspective? Because that's, what, that's all what matters. And in fact, if you take their perspective, it may surprise you. 
So Kate loves the likes the haircut. That's that's good to know. Um, all right. So that was the first object. What do you think is the next object gonna be? Well, the next object I'll tell you in a minute. Because the second mistake I made is I did not understand Giovanni's point of view. And because of that, how did Giovanni respond? He shut down completely. Because in that meeting, while I was presenting the insights, he did not respond. He bounced off the idea of the ideas. And now the question is, how did that happen? Why did that happen? It has all everything to do with this picture. The question is, what do you see in this picture? I know this is a professional takeover. Uh, let's see if Kate likes this picture too. But what I found imp find important is this picture, and I'll tell you soon. So what do, what do you see? What do you see in this picture? So what most people see is two naked people, two naked people in a bottle. And research shows that what most children see is not two naked people, but dolphins. And you and your dirty mind cannot imagine where the dolphins are. But if you look well, you will see them. It's the dolphins are in black, as you can see here. Can you see them? Maybe it's easier like this. So you see the dolphins. So the dolphins are in black. And what this shows, so why, why I show this picture, what is the takeaway here? Children see dolphins. They see something else than most adults do. And why is that? It's because they have a different perspective. It's they have had different experiences and they haven't seen the same things that we have. And your stakeholders and people in the business may not be children. They may behave like children sometimes, but they are not children, but they do have a different perspective. They don't have the technical skills that you do. They don't have this analytical mindset that you do. So it's important for you to understand that they have different goals and a different way of looking at the world. And that's why it's so important that you view their perspective. To give one more example, so here you see two people. Imagine you're the blue person and you're having a discussion with the colleague. And you say to the colleague, you're having a discussion and you say, the answer is 19. And your colleague says, no, that's nonsense. It's not true. That's not the right way to go. That's not, the, that's not what we see. That's not the solution. And only once you walk to the other side of the table, you see that the other person is right as well. And many business problems, many business situations are not black and white, not one or zero. That's not how it works. So it's important for, for you to take the other perspective first before you start talking data. And this is not what I did in the, in the situation with Giovanni. Because in the situation with Giovanni, I was talking data, technical stuff, and not really understanding his goals. Theodore Roosevelt has a great quote that is related to this. And he said, people don't care how much you know until you know until they know how much you care. And in my experience, it is very true because first people want to see that, they that you care about them, that you have their best interest at heart, and then they want to work with you. Then they listen to you. So what you can do in your first, in your next collaborations, in your next conversations with stakeholders, ask them what is important to you in this project or in, in work in general and get to know them a bit better. What are their KPIs? What is, what is their bonus dependent on? How are they influenced by other people? Because in the end, all those questions, the answers to those questions reveal how other people make decisions and how they will use your data or not use your data. Let's have a look at the chat. Good. So 
if you want to enter the raffle, uh, put hashtag mind speaking there. We'll do the, the raffle soon. So this was the second object. Now let's go to the third object and see what was the third mistake I made. So here we go. Third mistake. If I don't involve Giovanni before the meeting, then Giovanni doesn't feel hurt. And this is a big mistake I made, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Because it will refer to the next object. Finally, the hammer. I think Kate was very excited to, to see the hammer, maybe more people. And this relates to my first question in the first minute, namely about the IKEA effect. Because if you've ever bought something at IKEA that you assembled yourself, how did you feel after you finished? Maybe you were frustrated, but maybe you were happy as well. Maybe you were proud you partly created something. And that's exactly what the IKEA effect says. The IKEA effect says that we overvalue, that we value stuff more if we partly created it ourselves. And that's why I brought this hammer because it's the IKEA effect. My point is you need to make your stakeholders part of the solution. You need to involve them at every stage, ask them questions, ask, for, ask them for their opinion so they feel involved. So they feel emotionally attached to your dashboard, to your insights, because it will not only give you great insights about what they need, but also they will support your solution and they will advocate your solution in that last meeting. And that re didn't really happen with Giovanni, unfortunately. Thank you for summarizing uh, Uzair. That's, uh, that's great stuff. So that was the IKEA effect. Another example is, um, is, is a company where that uh, created these packages that you can easily create cakes. The company is called Betty. It was an American company in the 50s and they were very, very successful. And they were very successful because they had this, uh, this recipe and you added, you added water and you added, uh, you added milk and you added eggs and then you could create pancakes. But then they changed something. They changed something in the recipe and they removed all the ingredients. You only needed to add water. So they removed everything else. And what happened with the sales, you can guess it. So the sales went down. So they really didn't, didn't understand. They thought, okay, we made it easier for customers, for consumers. Why are they not buying anymore? So they hired a group of psychologists and then they found out. People did not feel involved anymore. They were not part in the process. They took away all the, the fun and the, the involvement. It was too easy. So that's another example of the IKEA effect. So to summarize, we had three objects and three mistakes diving in too early we had this picture about understanding the perspective of the business also the hammer involving people and the ikea effect and now we come to the fourth mistake so what what happened is if I go into details, and I went into details and technical stuff in that presentation, then Giovanni, the guy in the management team, he raised objections. And then the question is, what do you do with people who raise objections? Let me fix my camera in the meanwhile so you can think. So what do you, what do, you do when people raise objections. It's very simple. You shut their mouth. Well, not really. This roll of tape stands for something different. It stands for something different. It stands for 
making your ideas stick. And there's a great book from uh, the brothers Heath. They published a book made to stick. It's a great book. And they have six principles in the book. I added one, print, one more principle. So there are seven principles right now to make it stick. So let's have a look at those uh, principles. How can you make your idea stick? So the first principle is simple. So may, you may want to write this down. Seven principles to make your idea stick. The first one is simple. Make it very simple because your audience is not as tech savvy. The second one is unexpected. Don't make it a really boring story, but have some unexpected turns as well. The third one, make it concrete. Make it concrete with examples. The fourth one, credible. People need to believe you and people need to want to work with you. And an important factor there is to champion your work, to show uh, what you can do with data and what you have done at other departments. Not to brag, but to help them understand what are the possibilities with data. Because you, as a data professional, it's your job to also educate others. Then E, emotional. Make people feel something. We'll go, come back to that in the storytelling start part. Then the S for similarity. They need to be able to relate to your story. And that brings me to the last principle, which is stories. Storytelling is really important. We'll get to that. So again, seven principles to make your ideas stick. If you write them down, all of them, they will follow, they will make an acronym, namely success. I think it's incredibly cheesy, but it helps to remember. So simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional, similarity, stories. Those seven principles will make your ideas stick. I briefly talked about data storytelling. So who, who likes data storytelling in the room? I know Kate loves data storytelling. And some people like, uh, like storytelling because of the visualization, but some people forget that data storytelling is not only about visualizations. It's about narrative as well. A narrative, I will show you in an example how this works. So imagine you went on a holiday in Italy. So you can say, often people ask, hey, how was your holiday? And you can ask and you can tell them about your holiday and say, well, they had really good wine and good food and the people were nice as well. And they had good beaches. As you can hear, it's all about and, 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 and. It's very boring. So how can we do this differently? If someone asks you, how was your holiday in Italy? You can answer like this. I went to the, indeed to the holiday in Italy. They had great wine and nice food, but on the fourth day, we got a flat tire and we need to walk 10 kilometers to get a new tire. Therefore, next time when I rent a car, I'll make sure to check if there's a spare tire in the back of my car. Is this a fantastic story? I'm not sure, but it's for sure much better than the one before. And why is that? Because we don't talk about and, 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 but we follow a different narrative structure, namely and, but, therefore. And the but, creates some tension because everything goes well. The, the wine was great. The food was great. But on the fourth day, we got the flat tire. And that's where the tension is. And this tension is important because it holds people's attention. And it emphasizes on your most important point. Let's have a few more examples. I can say, last week, there was a man in my training. 
because I give training for data professionals about communication and understanding the business and storytelling. So last week, there was a man in my training. He was smart and he had great data skills. But he told me that people were not listening. They were not listening to his logical insights. Therefore, I helped him put his data in a story. So again, and, but, therefore. You can also use this. Later, I will show you how you can do this when you present your insights. But you can also do this when you introduce yourself and when you share about your career history. I can also say, I enjoyed my work, my consulting work in data, and I had the opportunity to do international projects, but I felt the desire to help other people grow, to give training on communication skills. Therefore, I started mind speaking. Again, how can we do this in data? Because I gave a few simple practical examples. Now let's have a look how we can do this in data. I'll share my screen again to make it a bit more uh, easier to follow. So. Here we go. So what you can do is and, 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 but it's, it's very boring. So you can say, here's a data, here's more data, here's a graph, and here's a conclusion, here's a conclusion. But again, you need to include the word but for some tension and uh, conflict. So how do we do that? How do we do that? So you can say sales was 20% down and employee retention was declining and customer service waiting time was plus 40%. But it's not very compelling, is it? But you can also say sales was down 40% and employee retention was declining. But what was most striking is, was that customer service waiting time went up by 40%. Therefore, I recommend improving the FAQ page. So what this has is a few observations the most striking observation behind the but and the recommendation after therefore. Now the question is, how can we make this even more powerful? How can we make this little data story even more powerful? What do you think? What do all the data, what do all the Disney movies have in common? What do all the Disney movies have and how can we improve this? I'll tell you. So what all the Disney movies have is characters. So all real stories have a character, right? So the question is, if we imagine we present this story to a group of marketeers, what should be the character? Who should be the hero? What do you think? So if we present to a group of marketeers, do we put the marketeer itself as the hero? Or should we put ourselves as the hero? Who should we put as the hero? The, the answer is we should make include a character, a protagonist that the audience cares about. And of course, the group of marketeers, they care about customers. So we need to put customers at the heart of this story. So how do we include it? We can say the paint a picture of a client who is getting frustrated. For example, John. John is a loyal client, has been a client for 20 years. But when he had a question, he rang up the customer service and he, has, he was waiting for four hours until his question got answered. Therefore, he left as a, a loyal customer, and this is something we want to prevent. And then again, you can recap this and but therefore framework for your recommendation to make sure that John, this customer, does not go away. And for sure, they will 
it will be memorable. Another one is to a Disney trick is to make the ending uh, a happy ending. So what you can say is John will stay as a as a as a result of the FAQ page. John will stay as a happy customer, and the benefits are that the employee retention will go up, and this will make your data story, your insights, not only more understandable but also more powerful. But because we know from research that stories are more memorable, but especially more persuasive. So that was about the end, but therefore framework. A last practical tip before we go to the raffle. Imagine you're presenting data insights and you can say implementing this recommendation will gain us $5,000. Okay, fine, sounds good, but how can we make it more powerful? We can, we can do that with loss aversion because loss aversion is about people love gains, but they hate losses twice as much. So for example, you can say for smoking cigarettes, you say you gain five years when you quit smoking cigarettes, but what's more powerful is if you say, you lose five, year, five years if you keep smoking. People don't want to lose stuff. They're more scared to lose stuff than they're eager to gain stuff. So back to the example. If you're presenting data insights, you're saying implementing this recommendation will gain, will gain $5,000. But you can also say, if we don't implement this, we'll lose $5,000. And that's how we play in this loss aversion. So again, make your story stick with the seven principles with storytelling. And what this does to your brain is, is this. Because this is a, a wonderful picture of our brains. And we see the rational brain on top and the primal brain in the bottom. And what many data professionals do the mistake that many data professionals make is focus on this part. They talk a lot about the data, the facts. But as I mentioned in the beginning, the most of our decisions happen here. This is where most of the decision making happens in the primal brain. We're responsible for emotions. So how can we benefit this? So instead of showing the dry data, wrap your data into a story and understand what are the emotions of other people? What are their goals, their values, their beliefs? Because that will impact their decisions. And by understanding your stakeholders, understanding the business, you'll make a bigger impact with your data. So this was only uh, a bit less than an hour in my trainings, I go way deeper into these topics. And it's not just me talking, it's people in breakouts, uh, data scientists, data analysts, practicing the, these kind of topics, discussing how they do this, what, what the mistakes they make, and implementing these tips and tricks and practicing data storytelling. Because that's in the end, what makes you, what sets you apart from other data professionals. And of course, we're not going to end here because we still have the raffle and there's still one thing I want to share. Because in the beginning of this presentation, I talked to talked about Giovanni. I talked about Giovanni, my presentation that failed miserably. And I want to go back to Giovanni because two years ago, I met you, Giovanni again. And... This time I had a very different interaction because Giovanni was still small, still bold and had this big pasta belly. But something changed. We had a really different interaction, a cordial connection. And this time he was a client. And I think I learned my lesson because in the meantime, in, in those years, I learned that I should not 
jump into the data, into problem solving, but first understand his perspe perspective and realize that his perspective is very different compared to mine. So I walk to the other side of the table to see his perspective, what he in the business found important as a client of mine. And also I use data storytelling. I realized that people are not moved by rational facts, but much more by emotions, by storytelling, by impacting the primal brain. That's what I learned when I studied behavioral science. And that's what I keep on learning every day in data. So become a master at understanding your stakeholders and storytelling. Because I have certainly improved in this. And that's why this interaction with Giovanni was different. And my point with this Giovanni, with this story about Giovanni is that there are a lot of Giovannis in the world driven by emotions. There can be a Giovanni in me, and there can also be a Giovanni in you. And that's why I would like to encourage you in your next interactions with stakeholders, with the business, at home, or maybe even with friends, to not only focus on the spades and clubs, on the analytical side, but certainly also on the hearts and diamonds, the communication, the people skills, storytelling. Because trust me, to win, you need a four of a kind. Thank you very much. And of course, we still have the raffle left. So here we go. Are you excited? Because I am. Let's uh, share my screen again. And let's do it again. Here we go again with the raffle. Congrats congratulations, Alejandro Alacon. Great, a book is coming your way. Please send me a message and I'll make sure you'll get this book, People Skills for Analytical Thinkers. Thank you so much, everyone. For being here today, I was uh, I'm very happy to have done this presentation with all of you guys. I love the interaction, and I'm looking forward to speaking with you soon again. Thank you.